Hi, and welcome to Killing It. Today, we're talking to Tony Russo, author of Dragged Into the Light. When did you become a journalist? I started working for local newspapers right around 2004. I'd been a uh, a philosophy student and the way things happened in my life, I wasn't able to continue on. I wanted to keep going on in in philosophy. Um, And since I couldn't, I had to find a job that I could do and journalism fits in. I was also, I was also a history student. So journalism fit in very well. I was good at being bored and I was, (laughs) and I was good at taking complex things and trying to make them simple and started. My first job was literally covering the board of education, which is so mind numbing, you know, from there you, you can get features, you know, you say, look, you know, Sally won this award. And so you can do a feature on Sally. And then I was able to get a better job at a better newspaper. And I did that for 15 years. Wow. That's awesome. And then you were the editor of OceanCity.com, yes? Yes, that was my last non-freelance job. And I was running like this website for Ocean City, Maryland. It's a resort town. So we got a lot of traffic. And so keeping engagement up and stuff like that was important. And, you know, the thing that I missed when I left the hard news business was being able to tell regular stories about regular. So I was still able to do that a little bit um, on OceanCity.com. And I I also got into beer writing at that time. And I was able to tell stories about the brewers and about, you know, the different people who went to the breweries and stuff like that. So I still got to do features, which is really what I liked most about journalism. Oh, yeah, that must have been really interesting getting to know all those different people. Yeah, and it's people who've never... Like, that's the only time anyone's going to ask them about their life, you know, and that's the only someone's like, your life is interesting. Let's talk about it and put it in the newspaper. And that just doesn't happen to most people. So they were always very, uh, very happy to be in the paper. And I was happy to, you know, I got to meet really fascinating people and hear super cool stories. I got a taste for people and their super cool stories. So now do you do journalism freelance? We'll see. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I was doing journalism freelance before I started this book. I actually had written and hosted a show called This Is War. And on that show, I interviewed combat veterans, but it wasn't an interview show. So I would do like a three hour interview with them and then tell their life story over the course of, you know, 40 or 45 minutes. And it was a really good show. I didn't get the kind of listenership that they needed to continue it. So then after two years, I was just looking for something else to do. And this Sherry Schreiner thing kind of fell on my lap. And the initial project had changed. And so I ended up leaving the Sherry Schreiner podcast project and got permission to write the book. And then I spent the year doing that. And now the book's out. And it's funny when kind of careful what you wish for, because I'm always one of these, you know, we need more equity. We need more equity. We need more equity. And now I'm looking for a job and pretty much, pretty much every, every help wanted is kind of like, if you're a 50 year old white guy, you can apply, but I wouldn't hold your breath. You know, (laughs) I I get it and I'm happy about it, but it's also scarier than I thought it was going to be. But I, I have this book. I have another book that I'm working on. So you know, hopefully this book will do well enough that uh, that it won't be that bad. Oh, very cool. Is it in the same vein or is it a completely different book? Well, I have two books in the pipeline. The, the next book is completely different. I'm doing, helping uh, one of the, one, someone who wasn't on the show, but helping a veteran write his war memoir. Oh, wow. Um, it's, uh, it's, I'm just starting to write it and I'm, we're trying to make it a different book than people are used to seeing. He he wants it to definitely not be a war memoir. And so it's probably going to be more biography with memoir commentary. But my pitch for this guy is I, I always say he was the uh, he was a medic that treated Saddam Hussein when they pulled him out of the hole. He was on that team. Oh, wow. And that is one of the least interesting stories he told. Me. Oh, yeah. It's a bananas career like insane. It it, it was an insane career. And um, he was a medic. So, you know, kind of the through line is, you know, everything he has is because of dead people. You know, every time he learned a lesson, someone died, you know, and yeah, no, it's, it's, it's happy reading. (laughs) (laughs) It's always fun. (laughs) Yeah. But I'm looking forward to that. And then after that, I have another, another culty thing that I've been working on that I'd like to write and we'll see how that comes out. You sound busy. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just, no one's sending me any paychecks anymore. Well, that's yeah, the that's, tough part. <laughs> that is definitely, you definitely Oh, I'm doing that. plenty of work. 
<laughs> now, before we get into your unmasking of people behind cults, Lucifer, reptilian aliens, and the proclamation of a new world order, what do you do for fun? I, uh, as we were kind of just discussing, I, I write for fun. I, I read for fun. Uh, sometimes I'll watch some television, but I'm not, you know, I like to drink. I like to smoke cigars. I like to stay in my house with the exception of not being able to see my extended family and my grandchildren. I had the best apocalypse of all. Uh, it was, you know, I was starting this book and it's just like, well, I'm not going to be able to go out for a year. And then no one was able to go out for a year. You know, I, I had been working at home for so long that I was comfortable with it. I didn't have to make any transition. My wife, who's a teacher, was here. And we would just hang out in the backyard and look at the fish and then come in and work for a little while and then go back out and look at the fish. And we did that for a year. And it was really pleasant. You know, except again, I miss I miss my family so much. But oh, of course, yeah, my Still. kids are all away. But that that's what that's that's what I do for fun. I I, I write and I look at look at my koi pond. Well, that's awesome. <laughs> They're beautiful. What is your favorite beer? Well, what I always say is uh, my favorite beer is the one that I needed. Um, right now I'm drinking uh, um, what's called Dead Guy Ale. Dead Guy Ale is perfect for so many reasons. It's not it's not super high in alcohol and it's not it's not super offensive. Um, you know, there's always the concern is how hoppy is a beer going to be? How bitter? How tart? How this is a, just a nice Maybach that is beer flavored beer. And it's it's one of my favorites. The other one that I've been drinking a lot of lately is Founders Gold, which is, you know, cheap craft beer. You know, it's a Pilsner from Founders. I think they're out in Michigan. And um, yes, yeah, it's, it's a 24 pack of, you know, four and change percent beer uh, for twenty five dollars. You can't beat it. Yeah, right. <laughs> Hey, when you need it, at least and, it's and there that's for what, you. When it's hot and I've been, so I, I wrote about beer for a very long time. I've been drinking beer for a very long time. I don't, I mean, unless I'm, unless I'm driving someplace, I don't count it as an alcoholic beverage. Like I'll have one with lunch and not even think about it. And being able to just grab something, not having to say, ah, that's a 9% and I have a long day ahead of me. You know, being able to have a, a, a foreign change beer or two at lunch and just being able to just drink them as if they were water. It's pleasant. And it's, it's the best part about working from home. Can you tell me a little bit more about your book? Sure. The, the name of the book is Dragged into the Light, Truthers, Reptilians, Super Soldiers, and Death Inside an Online Cult. Kind of a funny story about that. I was fortunate enough during my uh, investigation to come across a documentary crew that was also doing the same investigation. And just in a friendly journalistic kind of way, we started sharing sources. Did you talk to this guy? No, I don't have his number. Well, here's his number. Did you talk to that lady? Oh, no. Well, here's her number. That kind of thing back and forth. And we just, when you're doing something this convoluted, it is just so nice to have someone to talk to about it. Just, just to say, you know, what do you really think of this? And so as luck would have it, COVID hit and they needed someone who could kind of tie the entire story together. So I was that guy. And I was shocked at how much I was. I mean, I thought I might be in it a lot, um, but I was in it way more than I than I thought I was going to be. And it's six episodes long. And it's cool. That part is, is wonderful. But what the kind of serendipitous part of it was, is they needed to know the title of my book. And I didn't have a title. Oh, no. And so the working title at the time was Dragged Into the Light, which publishers have since told me isn't a great title. <laughs> I don't know why. And I don't know if it's not a great title, but they, the publishers usually like to choose the titles. I, I think you know that. I, I, yeah. don't know, I don't know how often people know that. But publishers are like, well, you know, I want to kind of live or die by the name that I choose. And I'm like, well, I already said it on documentary. And he's like, fine. But then we had to come up with a subtitle that would do the work of the title. Oh. And that took almost as long to do as writing the book did. As I'm new to the digital marketing side of books and the idea of trying to keyword a subtitle without making it ugly is mm. one of the hardest assignments, you know, I'd I'd ever I'd ever received in my life, mostly because I wanted to put Sherry Schreiner's name in it. Um, yeah. I thought that it would be important for people to know that this was kind of a book about her. And all of the subtitles were awful. I must oh. have written a hundred of them. And finally we came up with something that was going to be broader because 
as I was finishing this book about these reptile conspiracy people, there was a, a guy, you know, blew himself up in Atlanta. And it came out that he was one of these kind of reptile people. And all of a sudden words, I swear to God, that were in my book that I felt like I had to define clearly because no one had ever heard of them were all of a sudden on the news every day. Oh, like wow. reptilians and the NWO and all of those things were kind of bubbling up as I was writing the story, but they just kind of exploded. And I'm like, well, now I can put just reptilians. I didn't want to put reptilians in the title because it might have seemed too weird. I didn't know. I thought it was a very relevant book when I was writing it. I didn't know how relevant. I didn't know that it was going to be the topic of national political conversation as it was coming out. Oh, yeah. And so we changed it. But up until that point, we were calling it something, 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 Sherry Schreiner. But anyway, so the book is about uh, Sherry Schreiner, who is an internet cult leader. The shortest version is she had a bunch of followers and one of them was Stephen Minio. And he was, uh, he was an enthusiastic follower. And one day Stephen met a woman who he started calling his wife. It was his, they weren't married and they weren't together long enough to be common law, but he started referring to her as his wife. And one night Sherry sent him a text message that said, your wife is a reptile witch and she's going to kill you. And Stephen lost his mind. Um, his wife's name was Barbara, Barbara Rogers. And he started attacking Sherry online, trying to discredit her in all sorts of ways. And then about two months later, he was shot in his forehead and Barbara was charged with the murder and it looked like Sherry was an actual true prophet. What I came to find out through investigating the book was she actually was a serial marriage splitter upper. She liked to separate husbands from wives. If she felt like the wives weren't on board, she would try to separate it and had succeeded multiple times in the past. Wow. Uh, yes. And once I started digging into how she treated her followers, it got worse and worse. It was just this kind of ostracism and online attacks that were part of a pattern. They weren't an accident. They were how she operated. Was there ever a question as to whether the real Barbara Rogers was arrested for the crime? Yes. There wasn't a real question. I mean, Sherry and her people were asking whether it was even Barbara who was arrested. Okay, because when you do look at pictures, it does look a little weird. So I was like, well, I don't really want to agree with her, but. <laughs> well, one of the things, yes, I, I, I've actually heard that before. I've answered this question before. And so I have a kind of a ready example. You ever see those before and after pictures of uh, supermodels in bathing suits? Yes. Right. And so think of how you're like, you're made up, you're going out, you're going to have a great time and they take your picture or you've been up for two days and are stoned and drunk, and then they take your picture. That's going to show there are going to be differences. There was also, she was, uh, she was a thin woman who got thinner toward the end. And that was something, uh, the hollow cheeks, I think, are another question that people ask about, but I don't. Uh... The question is always one level down. The question isn't, was that really Barbara Rogers who was arrested? The question is, who would pay someone to be Barbara Rogers and go to jail just so Stephen Minio could die? Do you think it's possible that one of Sherry Shriner's crazy followers set Barbara Rogers up? I don't think so. So the idea that Sherry sent an actual assassin to change places with Barbara, but that just gets Barbara off the hook. True. If the idea is to indict Barbara, getting her off the hook isn't like having someone else do her jail time is not, not really. I don't, I, but you know what? I don't know how. I know that these people that I call them the Shrinerites, I know that the Shrinerites believe what they say, but I don't think what they say is right. I think, yeah. <laughs> I think, I think that's the way to put it. Like most cults. Very many. To yes. Do you believe Barbara Rogers intended to murder Stephen? I don't think so. I don't think Barbara Rogers is is guilty of murder. I think one of the names, speaking of how I was going to name the book, the name that I wanted for everything and everyone turned me down because they said it was a dumb name and maybe it is, uh, was Depraved Hearts. And the problem with that is a, is a book, it looks, you know, what's going to be on the cover and is it going to look, look like a romance or a thriller? Oh, but yeah. The reason that I like that title is that there are three states that still have third degree murder. All the other states have second degree murder and then manslaughter. And Pennsylvania is one of them. 
And in Pennsylvania, it's called depraved heart murder. And it's called acting in such a way as to have a depraved disrespect, disregard for human life. Okay. And that's what they offered Barbara. And when she didn't take it, they upped it to murder one. And eventually she was convicted of murder three, uh, depraved heart murder. I think is fair. I don't think she wanted Stephen dead. I I do not think she murdered him. In my book, if you get all the way to the end, I suggest that maybe she uh, maybe she knew she was pulling it, but what she thought was going to happen wasn't. That's uh, that's a strong theory that was suggested to me by all the reading and stuff like that. I think given that she was convicted of like if you if you're holding a gun, if you're holding a loaded gun near a person's head, you are acting (laughs) with depraved disregard for human life. Yeah, I mean that's. Kind of the definition, right? And so by those lights, I feel like it was fair. I think there are a couple of places where the, the documentary folks and I disagreed. And I mean, we knew about it. Like we were we were talking and we're like, well, we're, you know, I'm not going to be the guy that tells this part of the story because that's not how that part of the story goes, you know, in, in my world. So there are a couple of things. I think if you would like to f- pull a conspiracy out of this, it's interesting that they didn't take her blood alcohol after the killing. You know how many times I had to go back and erase murder and right killing? Oh, no. <laughs> so after the killing and you can say, well, it's slipshod, but I don't know what, what the rules are for interrogating a drunk person. But yeah. she didn't act. She wasn't falling down drunk. But I believe Barbara was very, very drunk that night. And I do know that she was also on. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I know Stephen had taken uh, this drug called Kratom in huge quantities. I don't know whether Barbara did or not. No one ever will. They didn't do any of the tests, but they did sit her down and let her talk herself into this, into this hole, which I felt I felt was a little gross. Um, and I, I say that in the book, but I don't want to live in a world where there is no consequence for having your hands on a gun near someone's head. Yes, exactly. And so, yeah, I, that, there's a consequence for that. And for her, the consequences is, is 15 years. I don't know if she'll do them, but she got them. Did Barbara Rogers have a history of mental health issues? She had, but the mental health story, I, in, in my book, I don't, I don't address it for a couple of reasons. I don't think it had the kind of effect in the outcome that we think it might. That's very um, fair. And I didn't want to throw any confusion into what was really going on. You know, my whole, cause um, another young woman killed herself and, you know, people are like, well, she was schizophrenic. I'm like, was she, is that really what happened? You know, and a lot of times too often, again, are you in the book? We're like, oh, well, they were crazy. They had it coming. No one has it coming. No, of course. And doubt wasn't introduced to me when I discovered that Barbara had a history of mental illness. The reason I bring up mental illness is because as you said, you felt like the interrogation was gross. And I also felt from a little bit that I saw that she was being bullied into a confession, especially if she has mental illness and they know that. I felt like it was pretty unfair for them to treat her that way. Yes. And I don't, again, for me, I don't know how, I know that the alcohol plays a role. I don't know how her mood that day, and I'm not, not to, not to make light of her, her, her different illnesses, but you don't know which illness is happening at which time. Like if she's kind of in a, a old school term, but if she's kind of in like a manic mode, you know, maybe that makes her seem less drunk. Sure. But I thought that that muddied the waters in a way that it didn't need to. Because for me, the story isn't about why Stephen wanted to die or why Barbara was there when he did die. For me, the story was about the lengths to which people will go to protect their fragile reality. And whether you're mentally ill, I don't know if it plays a part in it. You know, like everyone's reality is very, very fragile. Absolutely. And... uh, (laughs) So my wife and I were out looking at the koi pond last night and um, we have uh, a frog, we call him Michigan J, and he was surrounded by fish food. And one of our big koi came up and it looked like she kissed him. Aww. And I said to my wife, what if all of a sudden there were just like two naked people standing in our pond right now? 
Like, <laughs> what if it was like a, a fish kisses a frog and they both turn into, you know, back into princesses, right? Right, yeah. What would I do? Like, do you call the police? That's, <laughs> that's mean to call the police. They think they're a prince and princess. No one knows how long they've been frog and, and fish. You yeah. know, and so do we raise them? And so, like, when your reality gets broken, you don't you don't know how to behave. Absolutely. Because if there's two naked people all of a sudden standing in your pond, you don't <laughs> ha- you, n- you not only didn't you expect it, but you don't have any frame of reference for yeah. how to go forward. What Sherry did was she built an intentionally unstable reality and she pushed people out of it all the time. And without her reality, which they had made their own, they were lost. And this is so much more about how lost Stephen was. I think of Barbara as, as a weak person. I think she's kind of in my, certainly in my story, she's, she's really kind of a flat character. I'm not unsympathetic, but she's Sherry's collateral damage. She's not an actor. What I think I even say this in the book, I, things happen to Barbara Rogers. Barbara Rogers doesn't make anything happen. And I she can see that. Yeah. goes along with whatever she needs to go along with. She's going to find the path of least resistance. So when you think of her as not an actor, not ever imposing her will on the world, it's hard to see her deciding to kill Stephen. Yeah, I could understand that. Whether she was super depressed or super manic or even suicidal herself is not, she's not the one who's dead. Yeah. So- we sat around the, the director and I, when they were doing the documentary, we sat around and we ended this story in like 10,000 different ways because Barbara technically is the only one that knows, but I don't think Barbara was there that night either. Yeah. And so like, you know, maybe she was supposed to kill him and kill herself. Like, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe you can so maybe all night and it's not going to get you anywhere, which is yeah. what's compelling about this, about the incident. But it's kind of boring about a story, which is why it's a different, I use it differently, I think, in my own story for that reason. And even the way that Sherry Schreiner picked Stephen, it seemed like he was looking for somebody. He, he, he totally was. And again, I have a, I have a, I think a, a mildly different view then the documentary came across with. But for me, um, oh, you for you, I'm I can I'm gonna turn around and ask you a question. I'm sorry, you're you're probably much younger than me. Were you alive during 9-11? Yes, but I was in fifth grade. All right. He was from North Arlington, New Jersey. He was from right up there. The way that so many people were broken by that incident, the attack, and they were lost. And Stephen was among them. He's, I guess, 17 in 2001. And trying to accept that this was a horrible thing that just happened was too much for some people. Okay. I mean, the truther movement began on September 12th, 2001. People wanted to know what really happened because just some randos taking down the greatest country in the whole world ever didn't work for them. Yeah. It couldn't be true. And if I can go back to my whole like reality thesis, their reality couldn't accommodate that. So they had to weave a reality that could. They had to inhabit a reality that could accommodate this regular attack as something either supernatural in many, in many cases or just conspiratorial in some cases. Although the Conspiracy theory almost always has religious component. Truthers, I'm going to make this up. And so I apologize for making up a number. Truthers have got to be 90% religious people. And so that's part of it. And so what happens is the world didn't end in 2002. The world didn't end in 2012, 10 years later. And people started to wonder, you know, maybe God isn't going to end the world in my lifetime. And again, that isn't something they can accommodate in their reality. Their reality includes being around for the apocalypse. And that's important to them. They have to tailor everything that happens to being part of the apocalypse so that they can maintain this fiction that is their real reality that the world is always about to end. You're right. That is, that's a fairly common theme in all of the infamous cults. 
that was my in to be able to understand them a little bit more. Like I was saying before, like naked people in the pond. If you knew for a fact that the world was ending in three days, how differently would you live your life? And then what if you really do believe the world is ending every three days? And what if you believe that for a decade? Yeah, like, what does that do to you? Yeah, you, you have to keep reinventing why the world didn't end. And inventing a new is definitely going to end soon. Not maybe not three days, but this year, many of certainly the Shrinerites, but many of the conspiracy people can't believe the world hasn't ended yet. And now they're embarrassed. That's kind of the way I put it. Okay. You know, you either have to double down on your mistake or admit you're wrong especially among the people who are attracted to conspiracy theories, there's no third way. There's no evolution. There's either you're wrong or you're right. And okay. you can't be wrong because your whole reality depends upon you not being wrong. It's not just your feelings that are going to be hurt. It's a world that you can't begin to navigate because it's based on something that's not true. Yeah. I can imagine that would be extremely scary. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I got so heavy. No, no, it was, it's good, but you're right. That's, that would be horrific. Have you experienced any pushback from the followers of Sherry Shriner? I haven't, I haven't since the documentary came out. I got a couple of, uh, I actually wrote a little, uh, little, see, at <laughs> least I denigrate myself as well as other people. I actually wrote a blog post about this one guy who, there's a there's a Bible story called Elijah and the Two Bears. And the shortest version I can tell it is Elijah, he's this big time prophet and he's walking past his town and the kids from the town come out and they're like, get out of here, baldy. And like literally says it in the Bible. Well, get your bald head out of here or whatever. <laughs> but they call him baldy and he gets mad and curses them. And then God sends two female bears to kill 42 of the 50 people. Wow. And yeah, it's setting aside the religious problems with it that was one of the stories that the shrinerites liked to tell because they knew that people were making fun of them and they're like yeah well you keep making fun of me and god's gonna send two bears after you and so there was this one gentleman who i was interviewing and he was he wasn't just lying i think he didn't know he was lying okay but when i pointed out things that he'd said to me and i said well you said this and this that's fine but which is it i wasn't even trying to back him into a corner. I, I said, I asked you this question and you said, yes. And now you're saying that that's not true, which is the case or what is the case? And his response is, you know, remember the story of Elijah and the two bears. And I'm like, oh yeah, no, I know you guys like that one. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the closest thing to a threat I got. I have had a lot of people reach out to me with more information since, but that's really kind of to be expected. One of the things that I think might be different for me, and maybe they haven't seen it. Maybe they don't get vice where they are, but I have left messages on their home phone. Uh, there are a couple of people I literally sent letters to their houses. I've sent them Facebook messages. I've sent emails to them at home and at work. And so I'm not, I'm not Stephen Minio. You know, I'm not some weak person who's, who's just going to let them hurt my feelings. You know, I, yeah. I, I also don't think that anyone would make a threat given that the police, I'm sure, will take it much more seriously this time than they took it when Stephen got his early threats from, yeah. uh, from persons unknown. Oh, absolutely. How was your experience working with Vice? It was a lot of fun. I learned that I certainly don't ever want to be in the movies, but I don't know if I would do it again, only because it was really tiring and labor intensive. But I am such an egomaniac. And if someone's going to let me talk to them for 12 hours, I'm, I'm going to do it. There you go. So, <laughs> so yeah, it was, they were, they were real. Everybody that was there was nice. It was interesting because it was during COVID. And so they took all these all of these way, way, over, not overboard, but like they didn't just want me to feel safe. They wanted me to like actually be safe, which which was really kind of them because I was nice. nervous. But yeah, it was it was great. You know, there's always tough things. I haven't seen the whole documentary yet. First of all, because I thought it wouldn't bother me how huge I'd gotten, <laughs> but Aww. it did. Um, but the other thing is that I don't want to, I didn't want to feel like I needed to address their story. Okay. Um, 
because I know that we have two different stories, as I've, as I've said, and as we would talk, cause we would have, you know, lunch together and we would really, they, I, I was up there, I think three or four times and we would drive around looking for places to shoot. And we would just be talking the whole time. And we talked a lot about the case, but we also talked about our personal lives and things. So uh, we got to be, you know, that kind of, uh, I don't know if you've ever, I mean, maybe like jury duty. I just, I don't do this at jury duty, but you know, when you're, when you're stuck with someone for a long period of time, eventually, you know, you're just going to at least have an affinity for them. Yeah. You know, unless they're a total asshole, you're going to be like, Hey, you know, you know, you're all right. So yes, I liked all of them and I think of them fondly. Have your family members seen the documentary? My children have. My wife's waiting for me. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, so I'm, the, I'm the oldest of uh, of six boys. So my brothers, most of my brothers have seen it. So yeah, it goes kind of how I thought it was going to go. And they liked it very much. Okay. Um, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful story. It's I've got to admit, it's more vanity than anything else is keeping me from watching it at this point. I just, I tried to watch it. I watched the first three episodes but then it really just got that i couldn't even get out of bed the next day it was just too depressing so oh i felt like i would just wait and to, like pick a weekend and just watch them all but now i have my book coming out and reviews are starting to come out and i'm like this is not the time well <laughs> yeah that's sp- true where you want to spend excess self-esteem on a television show you want to you want to keep your self-esteem in case you have an emergency at home you did do a great job I'm proud of everything I said. It was like, really, it was hard to, hard to watch. I also, I hurt my knee right before I got up there. And so watching myself limp around, I'm like, wow, that guy is so fat. His knees don't even work anymore. I'm like, I wanted to stop and say, no, no, no. I, I really hurt myself. Oh. And you're also self-conscious because if you watch documentaries, you know the parts that they're making them do because they're not professional actors and they don't look like they're naturally doing things. They look yeah. like they're being told to do things. And so whenever we were filming things like that, like there were a bunch of scenes in a bar and almost all the scenes of me writing just felt so phony. And they felt so phony because I'm not a good actor. I mean, I really was writing, but I was conscious that I was being filmed. Oh, <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? And I knew that I looked like someone who was conscious that they were being filmed. And that's that's also something that I didn't expect to bother me as much as it ended up bothering me. As far as the content, I'm sure it's a, these are bright, 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 bright people. I'm sure it's wonderful. Um, I feel like I came off well enough that yeah, people, I've gotten emails and things like that, which is also always crazy. And when people are like, hey, I saw you, like my neighbors stopped me. They're like, were you on television last night? I don't have a yard sign or anything. Yeah. <laughs> like I saw you on television last night. How weird is that? Like, yeah. Because of course I never leave my house. So I'm I'm like the block hermit as it is. <laughs> uh, That's okay, me too. <laughs> one time a neighbor asked me if I was blogging about him because I was just working on the porch. And he just always saw me kind of staring out into space, but, but in his general direction. And he's yeah. like, I feel like you're writing about me. Are you writing about me? I'm like, <laughs> You're going to write about the history of beer. So, uh, yeah, so I've got I've got that kind of half a whack job for uh, about me. All right. Well, is there anything else that you would like to mention? If you like it, please tell me. If you don't like it, definitely tell me because I, I take criticism pretty well. If you'd like a signed copy, you can get it by going to draggedintothelight.com and there's a pre-order there. Well, good luck and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.